All right. Let's talk about public key infrastructure or PKI. PKI is what allows people to verify digital certificates that are issued to them by certificate authorities. And they allow people to also obtain these digital certificates. So a PKI consists of a registration authority that registers the uh, entities, verifies their identities and make sure that they are who they claim to be. Certificate authorities are the ones that issues the digital certificates and stores them in a database such that a certificate checker can contact this database and check whether a certificate is valid or not, whether it's true or not, and make sure that everything with that certificate is correct. And a certificate management system that manages the communication between all of these entities. So as we said, the functions of a PKI is to do registration by the registration authority, do certification, which is issuing the certificate by a certificate authority. And there are three main other functions here, which are a key update, a key escrow, and a key recovery, which we will talk about next. So what is a key update? A certificate has a validity period. It also can be revoked, but let's not talk about that now. When a certificate gets expired, what should happen with recertification? So let's talk about the key life cycle in a PKI ecosystem. So when someone is first going to obtain a certificate, they generate a key and they ask for a certificate and then they use that key until the key expires. When the key expires, they need to update the key and then issue another certificate. One important thing here is you need a new key generation in step number five. You should not recertify the main original key that you generated when you first obtained your first certificate. Every time a key expires, it should be updated to a new key, which means a new key generation, and then the new key should be certified in a new certificate and gets used until it expires and get it gets updated and so on. What about a key escrow? So there are many factors that would let people think that I may need to escrow the key somewhere such that it can be accessed in the future in case something wrong happens or if it's needed or something like that. Especially for the root CAs, the, the, the big ones, the ones that get to certify other CAs and the other CAs get to do all the work of issuing certificates for individuals and organizations and businesses and things like that. So in the case of a root CA, first, the root CA can store its own private key in a physical secure place. And that seems reasonable. You put it in a physical place that has a lot of security around it, not easy for anybody to get into it, and it's not in any electronic format. So this means that you're confident that it's very, very, very hard for that private key to get compromised. Another way to store that private key is to store it in a setting that's called an M of N setting. This is a cryptographic setting where that key is considered the secret and it is cut into N pieces. And through that cryptographic setting, this whole key cannot be put back together, cannot be retrieved unless M of those N pieces agree that they need to restore the key. That way, if you cut it into like 12 pieces and you say, I need at least eight people to agree that it needs to be retrieved or restored, then you have confidence that there will not be any kind of coercion where two or three people might get together and restore that key and use it for malicious purposes. So this is another way to store the private key of a root CA in an electronic format in the setting of an M of N um, setting. 
And these root CAs, they are usually used to certify a number of intermediate CAs. And then these root CAs goes offline for security purposes. And then the root, the intermediate CAs are the ones who carry on the business of certifying other CAs or individuals or businesses or things like that. So the root CA may or may not do the same thing of storing private keys for its intermediate CAs or customers. They may do it, they may not do it. So this is something that you need to know about as well. If they do it, then they may also choose to put it in either a physical secure place or store it in an M of N setting as well. Let's talk about um, what happens in a case of an enterprise. An enterprise might be a little different in terms of storing, generating and storing the keys for its employees. So in a root CA, you may ask your uh, customers who come to you to generate their own public private key pairs and they send you the public key only. So the root CA does not know what the private key is. And then the root CA certifies the public key and sends them the, or sends the customer the certificate. In an enterprise, it's a little different. An enterprise might choose to generate the public-private key pair itself for its own employees, and it distributes these to them. So it's the one that generates the keys, and it gives them, gives them these keys. And here, there is an opportunity for the enterprise or the business to keep a copy of the private keys that it generates for its own employees. Usually, people differentiate between keys by how they are used, which means if the employee is going to be communicating confidential information, receiving confidential information, so they need this, infor this information to be uh, sent to them in a secure fashion, so they may need an encryption, decryption, private public keys. But if they are also going to sign messages or documents or code, then they will also need signing keys. So they will get two pair of keys. One pair is used for encryption and decryption. So one pair is used for confidentiality. And another pair that is used for signing or authenticity to authenticate that they are the person they claim they are. In that case, it's important to note that the enterprise may be able to store the encryption and decryption private keys, but should not store the employees signing private keys. Why do you think this is the case? So remember, when employees receive confidential information that belongs to their business, it really belongs to the business. So it's owned by the business. So if that employee gets sick or died or disappeared, like anything happened to that employee, how can the business get a hold of the decrypted information? Unless if they have a copy of the private key that can decrypt this information. So this is why an enterprise may store its employees encryption, decryption, private keys. But why shouldn't it do that for the signing keys? Seems obvious. If the enterprise has a copy of the private signing key or the, the, the private key that's used for signing, then we have destroyed the non-repudiation property for signatures. We based the non-repudiation property of digital signatures on the fact that no one other than the signer has access to the signing 
private key. In case of a dispute, the employee can come and say, I'm not the one who signed this message. I'm not the one who signed that contract. I'm not the one who signed that code. My company has a copy of my private key, of my signing private key. It may be them who signed that contract on my behalf. I hope that's clear. And this is why private signing keys should not be escrowed by an enterprise under any condition. Let's now talk about re revocation. So revocation is an important property that a PKI should be able to do because the private key may get lost. It may get compromised. There may be some human resources reasons. Somebody may be uh, uh, leaving the company. They may be retiring or there might be a change in their name or address or something that makes the enterprise or company or CA want to revoke that certificate to say that the certificate should not be used anymore. One interesting reason is that certificates may also be issued by mistake, like the last thing in here. Let's see an example of that. So in the early 2000s, VeriSign, which is a very well-known certificate authority, issued two digital certificates. These certificates said that they belong to Microsoft, they work at Microsoft, they represent Microsoft. This certificate could allow viruses and malware to pose as legitimate patches and updates. So these two individuals who tricked VeriSign, as VeriSign says, were able to obtain certificates that they can present with the code that they sign. And this, these certificates will look like they are from Microsoft and they are very legitimate certificates. So your computer will accept them and it will update your machine with whatever code they are sending. And that code might be a virus or a malware. And what did VeriSign say in the statement? They said, due to human error, we did not detect that the individual misrepresented that they worked for Microsoft when in fact they did not. So this is a very important reason to why we may need to revoke certificates. CRLs are lists of revoked serial numbers, serial numbers that are should not be um, accepted anymore. The list must be downloaded and checked by the verifier and it expires after 24 hours. So let's assume that this is a business that opens up at 9 a.m. and closes at 5, a, uh, 5 p.m. So that business in, in, the, in the first time they get to check somebody's um, certificate in, in the early morning, they have to download the new CRL from the PKI for, for whatever PKI this certificate is issued from. And they have to check that the serial number that is presented by the customer does not exist in this list. The next day, they this list is expired. They have to re-download a new one. And this list has each serial number that has been revoked since this PKI started its business. So this CRL just grows with time and never gets smaller. It keeps growing, which causes download issues, especially back in the days when the internet was very slow, slower than what it is right now. Then waiting for this CRL to download in, in its entirety was very time consuming. And it requires a lot of storage such that it can be stored on for 24 hours, especially when you think about that you may need to retrieve a CRL from multiple CAs every day. And each CRL might be a gigabyte or more. So that is a huge amount of storage that you will need. If you're doing your communication through a, an embedded device or a device that doesn't have a lot of storage, it becomes a problem. 
So people came out with the Online Certificate Status Protocol, OCSP. It is still a list of revoked serial numbers, but it's stored at the PKI site. So it doesn't get downloaded. What happens is that the person who wants to check a certificate validity, they send the serial number to the PKI and the PKI sends them a message back that says whether it's good, whether it's bad, or I don't know. You might be thinking like, what does an I don't know mean? What's unknown? We will see that in the future. It actually resulted in an attack that we may take a look at if we have time at the end of the semester. Um, and this has caused less burden on the network and the client resources. You don't have to download a huge amount of CRLs on the checkers site, and you don't need to have uh, a, lar a large amount of storage such that you can store these CRLs that you download from multiple CAs. The last thing that we have here in the functions of a PKI is cross-certification. Cross-certification is when two CAs sign each other's public keys, which, makes, with, which means that they issue certificates to each other such that the users of one CA can verify um, and, and find a legitimate chain to users who have certificates issued from the other CA because of this cross-listed certification. It allows the nodes under each CA to trust each other, but the problem with it is that it's a lot of legal work and paperwork that people usually don't want to do it.